Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. We go and bless the reading of his word. We are currently in a series called I Am Who I Am. In this series we are studying the character traits of God. We say to each other that if we study Him, we get to know Him, and we stand all in front of Him, then that will give us encouragement, it will give us strength, it will give us perseverance, it will give us resilience. It is exactly what we need in the beginning of the year, for our minds to be blown by God Himself. We won, I preached, and my theme was simple, and that is Yahweh is our God. And we did a deep study of God's name, Yahweh, and the meaning of His name. And then we applied it to our lives and what that means for us. And what we said is it's phenomenal to know that He is with us, He is always with us, and He will always be who He says He is, and that is with us. Last week, we did a phenomenal job to take us through a thing called Yahweh is our gracious judge, in that He said that God is our King, and then He said God is gracious, and then He said God does not leave the undisciplined, unpunished. He wants to correct us and He'll do it as many times as He needs to because He has His glory and our fulfillment and our obedience in mind. Today, our theme is Jesus' family story. Jesus' family story. Now, if we read this teaching text as it is, this was the first time that you ever opened up the Bible and you only heard this story and you only heard these five verses, you would have thought that it is a really cool story. I mean, let's face it. There's enough in the story that makes you feel, well, oh, this is quite cool. I mean, a transcendent being, something called a Holy Spirit, someone falling pregnant, supernatural, the word prophet is mentioned, something about promises that's being fulfilled. Like, this is a really good story if you read it as is. It'll be the same as watching the last installment in a movie that has many parts. Think for a second, here's a photo of the Avengers and a picture of Avengers Endgame, the very last movie in the franchise. Like, you can watch Endgame and go, Woo! That was huge! These two opposing powers against one another, everyone with all of these special powers, some fighting for good and some fighting for evil, not giving away the plot line, I promise. And then you feel this tension of who's going to die and who's going to live at the end. I mean, it is a heavy movie, and if you play it today and you watch it, you'll probably go, Well, this is, this is a great good movie. Or let me step into Lord of the Rings. Well, I believe it's the greatest movie of all time. If you would watch The Return of the King today, you would think that it's a great movie. I mean, let's face it. This awesome, noble king with integrity, fighting for the good of Middle Earth, with all these other people, this wizard, and there's these noble folk called the elves, and there's these small people, kind of my length, the hobbits, and then people even smaller, but way more aggressive, called the dwarves, and they're all fighting together, and it's once again these two kingdoms clashing with one another, and you wonder how it's going to end. It is a great movie if you watch it just as it is. But anyone who loves Avengers, and anyone who loves Lord of the Rings will tell you, dude, whoa, 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 whoa. You need to know the backstory. You need to know how this story came to this point and how all of these characters fit together. You need to know where all of this comes from. It's the same with the story of Jesus. Like, we can read these five verses today and go, this is a really cool story. But what we actually need to know is the backstory. Because when we know the backstory, we'll understand him, his character traits, and why he did what he did way better. I don't know if you've ever met someone's family. And then the moment you met their family, you go, Oh, I now I understand why he says what he says, why he jokes about what he jokes about, why these things are important to him. 
Because, I mean, you could get to know me, but once you meet my brother, and my other brother, and my dad, you go, oh my word, they are all cut from exactly the same cloth. Same blood in the veins, you know. Then you understand someone and their mannerisms and their character better. So in exactly the same way that you shouldn't watch Avengers Endgame first, you should start with Captain America. And in the same way that you shouldn't watch Return of the King, but you should watch The Hobbit first. In the same way, when we really want to understand the significance of these five verses that the viewer just read to us, we have to start with the backstory, And we have to understand where this whole story comes from. Now, there's three big waypoints or three big markers, and I've made them my three points for my sermon today. So here's our map for today. We have to look at God's creation, specifically using the word God there. God's creation, humanity, and sin. You need to understand that part of the story. Then we are going to look at Yahweh's covenant, intentionally using God's name there. Yahweh's people and Yahweh's promise. And then we will look at judgment, hope, and salvation. And after we've landed with salvation, we'll pick up these five verses again. And you'll go, oh, this is absolutely mind-blowing where this story comes from. So keep your Bible open. Keep your Bible app open. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture today. Now, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, I'm really praying that you will be in awe and that you'll realize today how absolutely brilliant God becoming human and the birth of Jesus is for you. Because this is the signal that God decided to get involved himself. And this is the signal that God decided to do what he promised he will do. We sang that earlier. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, but you're listening to the sermon, I'm really hoping that just the story of the Old Testament will compel you to believe that this is all the truth. I mean, the best argument to make for Jesus, for his legitimacy, for his salvation, for his being, and for his supremacy, is to read the story from the first page. Like once you get to Jesus becoming a human being, or to Jesus being born, you can't argue with the story. And that's the argument that I'm going to try and make this morning. Are you guys ready? Okay, awesome. We're going to start at page one of the Bible. It's going to take us a couple of minutes to get to Jesus, but I promise I'll work economically with my words. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right in. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open up our eyes, that you would open up our minds, that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up our spirits to be receptive to what you want to say to us. We look at the bread, we look at the cup, we think about your sacrifice, we know that we'll once again taste your love this morning. I pray that the reading of the word and the exposition of the word will prep us for that moment, and that we will leave today encouraged, that we will leave transformed, that we will believe in your love and your good news, and that we will leave strengthened what it is that you would have us know, say and do in these coming days. I pray for you. Amen. Okay, so let's jump in. God's creation, humanity, and sin. The first big waypoint, the first point of my sermon. We need to go back all the way to page one of the Bible. You might be familiar with the story, you might not. Let me just say a couple of things. The first page of the Bible is all about God creating. He speaks and He creates. And when He creates, He puts it in its place. And when He puts it in its place, He says, this is good. It's a great story, right? This supreme God speaking a word and all these beautiful things that we know creation to be coming into existence. At the end of page one, God creates human beings. Man and woman, He creates them. He creates them in His image as little statues of Him. He commissions them to look after all of this that He, that he has created. He creates the institution of marriage for them to be two and one, one and two. And then He lives with them in a setting called paradise in the garden. And it gets described as a place of abundance, as a place of beauty, and as a place of perfection. Then on page 2 of the Bible, or in chapter 3 of the Bible, a serpent makes his appearance. It's a really weird animal, it's a really weird character in the story, but that is how the story unfolds. And not only a serpent or a snake, but a serpent or snake that can speak. I don't know how many of you have ever seen that. Like we went to Kruger National Park last Sunday, we saw some snake tracks, but I'm pretty sure that those snakes don't speak. Okay, so it's an interesting character. We don't know where the snake comes from, but we know that this snake resembles and embodies everything that is wrong in God's creation. Because up until that point, everything was really awesome in God's creation, as well as in his relationship with human beings. And now the serpent comes along, and his whole posture is one of rebellion, and one of deception, and one of misleading people. 
He has a conversation with the humans, Adam and Eve they were called, and he gets them to the point where they doubt, and when they doubt, they sin, and when they sin, they literally do what they know they should not do. God created a beautiful boundary for them. He said you can do all of these things, this is the one thing you should not do, and that is the one thing that they did do. And sin came into the world in that way. If you want to read the conversation between the serpent and the man and the woman, go read verses 1 to 6 of Genesis chapter 3. We won't be reading that this morning, but what I want you to know is very soon in the story, paradise is gone and paradise is lost. This beautiful vibe that God had with His human beings in the garden is all done. And that hurts Yahweh. Why? Because He created something good. And He commissioned the human beings to keep it good. And He commissioned the human beings to experience the beauty of the abundance of the garden. And they chose to do the one thing that they should do. Now, it would be fair for Yahweh at this point to be angry, but he's not. What's interesting is he approaches the humans and he wants to speak to them. And he wants to give them an opportunity to be honest about what happened. And as you guys can guess, the human beings are not honest about what happened. They start blaming one another and they start being, um, oh, no, I can't think of the, estranged. They start feeling estranged from God himself. Now, what's God going to do is he going to bless them? Is he going to curse them? Is he going to correct them? What's really important for us to see very early in the Bible, and that will lead to the bread in the cup here, is that it was never God's intention to curse human beings. He never does that. He only curses the serpent or the snake. Let's read this. And I want you to see that I've bolded some words, and I also underlined them. The reason why is all of these names and all of these words and all of these characters are really, really important as we progress through the story of the Bible. If this was a movie, I would be strolling from scene to scene. And you would see a picture of the characters. But now they only have words. And that's why I bold and underline them for you. Okay, so let's read. So the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, the one who revealed himself, the one who has a personal name, the one who we can know, like this is the one we're talking about, said to the serpent, this character, that brought in this sinful pattern in this world, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman. So all of a sudden there's these two parties, you and woman, and all of a sudden there's hostility. Up until this point there was no hostility. And between your offspring and her offspring, so we see two offsprings that's going to develop through the course of the story. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So we see a double strike, we see a fight, we see a war, and then it looks like death. Because a head will be struck and a heel will be struck. Okay, so this is a really important scene in the story of the Bible. Rebellion, as well as rejection, is happening in the story up until this point. Obviously, Yahweh is hurt. And the question is, what will now become of his good world? If we look at this part in Genesis chapter 3, what we see what will come of his good world is there will be a struggle. And the struggle will start at this point and it will continue all the way until someone comes that will crush the serpent that will also be bit on his heel. Okay? So we're going to have to trace an offspring. We're going to have to trace the offspring of the serpent, the evil offspring, and the offspring of the woman, the righteous or God-created offspring. And we're going to have to hold on to this moment where they will eventually get to this fight, where this heel will be crushed and where this heel will be struck. Okay? Now, if you read Matthew 1, verse 1, you will have seen that the book starts with the genealogy. So Matthew, the writer, traces back all the way to Adam, because he wants you to know that the story of Jesus being born started even before this scene that we just studied. Okay, there you guys with me. So what happens now? There's these offsprings, two offsprings, one of the serpent and one of the man. And the question is, as we study these two offsprings, who does right and who does wrong, who honors God and who doesn't, who is serious about the commission he gave them and who's not serious about the commission he gave them. And the shocking thing is, in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, it just goes from bad to worse. It's really depressing chapters to read. If you are going to read them, read them fast, read them quick, and just get them behind you. Because people keep on sinning. God keeps on saying, I want to bless you, I want to have you live, and people keep on sinning and saying, we don't want your blessing, and we don't want to live your way. And then in the end, God has to end that part of humanity, has to restart again, and then we see this beautiful moment, early in the story, that God decides 
to start again, to start in a new way, to start with a new person. Okay, so awesome creation, really bad effects of sin. Now all of a sudden we are at the second important way, which is called Yahweh's covenant, Yahweh's people, Yahweh's promise. So I want you to take note of the word covenant because we read about that now. Another part of scripture that we're going to read is going to be all about his people. And then the last part of scripture we're going to read is all about his promise. Okay, so this is a really important part of history that we need to understand. Okay. So God approaches a man called Abraham and he speaks to him. Uh, he speaks to him. Here's what he says. Let's read it together. The Lord, here we go, Yahweh, said to Abraham, a human being, human beings were important to God from the beginning, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Oh, okay. So it's not all doom and gloom. A great nation is what lies ahead in our future. I will bless you. Yay! That's not all done. Like God had blessing in the beginning. He blessed everything he created. And he blessed humanity. It didn't look like it worked out well. And now he's renewing that blessing. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. So not only will I receive blessing, but I will be a blessing. God says to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was the purpose in the beginning of creation, that all the peoples on earth would be blessed. Unfortunately, because of sin and brokenness that entered through that pattern from the serpent and the woman and the man, people did not live in that blessing. But now God says, my covenant to you is I will do all of these this is what I am promising to you. Now it's interesting, in Genesis 11 verse 30, it says that Abraham and Sarah could not have a child. And now God says to them, that's not a problem for me. I can transcend that or I can move past that. Here's what I want you to know. I will make you a great nation. Now let's just pause here for a second. Isn't this an awesome, steadfast, faithful, loving God? Who, after disappointment of disappointment and after disappointment, says... I'm, I'm still working my plan. Like, I'm not done with you guys. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try in a different way. And this will all end in salvation. And this will all end in blessing. This is what I am doing for you. Now, if you read the story in the book of Genesis, up all the way up to Exodus, you'll see that blessing is a really, really big pattern and theme in the book. Everyone says, Yahweh, you said that you'll bless us. Where is my blessing? I'm here for my blessing. I want to receive my blessing. That's a pattern that we'll study maybe at a different time. Eventually, after a, uh, um, a combination of various events, this people of God, this great nation that He promised, ends up in a country called Egypt. And in Egypt they live in a very oppressive space or under an oppressive regime. God calls Moses. He says, through Moses I will lead my people to salvation and I will liberate them. And just as God promised to Abraham, he now promises to his whole nation through Moses that he will bless them, that he will save them, that he will make them a great nation, and that he will do to them what he promised to do to them in the beginning. Okay. And then we read this story in Genesis 19. So the people of God have been liberated from Egypt. They've left their slavery there. They've been saved. And they are now on their way to this country or the promised land, the place of blessing that God has prepared for them. And then we read in Genesis 19, oh sorry, in Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. Moses went up the mountain to God, there we go, Elohim, and the Lord, Yahweh, called him to him from the mountain. So same God that we found right at the beginning of the story, still going there. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. Okay, God is still busy with this group of people that he wanted to bless in the beginning. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried your eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you carefully listen to me and you keep my covenant, look at that. Carefully listen. This is what I wanted from you in the beginning. And keep my covenant. Do you remember that we've got an agreement going here? I'm not coming left field or out of nowhere. Like, we created an agreement with one another. You will be my own possession, right? The possessive pronoun there is really important. Out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. God is still busy with humanity. He's still busy with people. He's still busy with groups of people. He's still busy with nations. 
And this specific nation called the Israelites, he gives them this name, a kingdom of priests. So that's the first time that this word pops up uh, in the story of the Bible. Now what is a priest? A priest is a bridge. A priest is a connection. A priest is a mediator. A priest is someone who stands between the two parties. That's what a priest is. And God says to his people, what I want you to be, is I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want you to be a bridge for other people to me. Do you guys see how God was always minded of other nations and other people and all the peoples of the earth? So he's saying to this specific group of people, your job is to live in such a way that people will see me, my goodness, my love and my faithfulness. And then your job is to tell them about me. You ought to be the mediator. People will come to me through you. And that's why I gave them all these laws to live according to so that their lives were different than the other nations that they also found um, on earth at that point. Okay. So what happens now is this group of people takes this commission, they take these laws, they occupy the promised land. There's a whole story and a whole lot of history that happens there. And eventually they establish a kingdom in a nation called Israel. And then we find this one king in the nation of Israel called David. He did well as a king. He was known for unifying the whole kingdom. He was known for putting good economy in place. He was known for justice and righteousness to a certain extent. He was known for being a phenomenal army general. And he was known for a time of prosperity. He ruled uh, in a time in Israel when Israel prospered. So you find David's name back in Matthew 1 as well. Okay? So the writer of Matthew traces back the story and then he jumps on all these big waypoints. And David is one of them. Now there's a real re big reason why David gets mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. So I want to read us a scene from 2 Samuel 7. What happens here is David gets an idea and then he pitches it for the prophet Nathan and then Nathan answers him back. And his idea is I want to build a house for God. And then Nathan answers him back and says the following. Let's read 2 Samuel 7. The Lord, same one, still going at it from the beginning, declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. And when your times come, sorry, when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, that's really important. There's a whole story before this. I will raise up after you your descendant. Well, hello, we've heard descendant right in the beginning. Who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Do you guys remember in the beginning? We saw that these two offsprings, one will be evil and one will be good. Now this is all about the good kingdom. He's the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's a huge promise, because forever means forever, 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 and ever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. A really intimate relationship going there. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him, as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. This is a huge promise made to an earthly king, saying that out of his descendants, someone will rule. Someone will establish a kingdom. And that ruler and that kingdom being established will remain forever. Okay? So can you see the traces or the themes from the beginning and from the first part that we studied? Okay, so up until now, let's just take stock. We've seen someone is going to crush the serpent. That's great news. We've seen that God uh, uh, um, went into a covenant with Abraham and the people of Israel so that everyone can be blessed. That's really, really important. Thirdly, we saw that the people of Israel, or God's people, are supposed to be, live in a way that it creates interest from other people and that other people can get to God. And then the fourth one now is we saw that there's this one king that's going to rule like an absolute champion and he's going to bring all of these things together. Okay? That's what we saw up until now. Are you guys with me? I know there's a lot of Bible content, but it's really important for us to know how the story is better. Let's look at the third big waypoint, and this will be our last portions of Scripture. So judgment, hope, and salvation. Now if I would ask you now, does this God have the right to judge? You would definitely say this. Why? Because of everything that you've just seen. If I pitch the word hope to you now, in the context of this story, you would definitely say that people do need hope. 
Because we've seen all of these bad cycles and circles of sin just causing a devastating effect in history. And if I preach the word salvation to you now, you would definitely say that is much needed in this story. Someone has to save God's people. That's why we have the history of the kings of Israel in the Bible. So, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles all tell the stories of the kings of Israel. Now, if you read 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you'll read about 40 kings. 20 in the northern part of Israel, 20 in the southern part of Israel. The 20 in the northern part of Israel gets a zero rating. Like zero out of 20 kings did anything right, according to the guy that wrote Chronicles. In the southern part of Israel, 8 out of the 20 did something right. So 8 out of 40, guys, that is a horrendous fast. But there's a reason why this history is written to us. Because the writers of the Bible want us to know why we needed judgment and hope and salvation. So the story continues. Eventually the kingdom splits in the northern and the southern part. Eventually the northern part falls. Eventually the southern part falls. And eventually all the people of Israel, both north and south, are taken away into exile. Some people are in a country called Assyria. Some people are in a country called Babylonia. Some people are brought into their country to live there as if it was theirs. It's a shocker of a story. It's really, really depressing. Let's be honest. Like, I read through that history recently. I'm up until Isaiah 17 now. It is a hard history for me to read. I read 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings when we were on holiday at the sea. And I remember reading it one morning going, this really doesn't set me up for a good day. You know, like, I would have a day on the beach with my wife and kids, play some beach pad, put on some sunscreen. This is so depressing. Like, why, dude? Why do you do so wrong? You know what's right. You shouldn't do it. I can't believe you're killing him again. It's a really, really tough story to work for. But it is a hopeless and a very depressing story in which we need someone to judge and set it right, in which we need hope, and in which we need salvation. Okay. Now, in this part of history of the Bible, there were prophets. Prophets were called to speak on God's behalf, to say His words, and to tell the people what to do and also what not to do. One of the most awesome prophets in the Bible is the biggest one in terms of literary footprint is Isaiah. And we find this awesome piece of hopeful um, poetry in the beginning of Isaiah 11. So let's just read Isaiah 11. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse. Let's just pause there. Is a shoot small and fine, or is it big and strong? It's really small and fine. Why is there a stump? Because in Isaiah 10, you'll read that God's judgment means He's going to chop down everything. And He's going to chop down the people of Israel like a big tree, and they'll only be left with a stump. That is very, very depressing. Now, there's a shoot that will grow from the stump of Jesse. Okay? Jesse was David's father. So it's Obed, Jesse, David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Okay, so the shoot will become a branch. That's great. So there's possibility of life. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Yes, please. This sounds like the guy we want. Why? The Spirit of the Lord was involved in Genesis chapter 1, hovered over the sea. The Spirit of the Lord was what was needed to create order out of chaos. The Spirit of the Lord has a way of creating something new and beautiful out of something that looks really empty and dark. We want this. And now Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. A Spirit of wisdom. Yes, we want a king with wisdom. Understanding, yes, that is definitely what we want. A spirit of counsel, amen. A spirit of strength, yes, please. A spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be, verse 3, in the fear of the Lord. This is the king we want. Because all the kings we've had up, up until this point just didn't nail it. They were really unwise. They had no knowledge. They had no counsel. They had no strength. They were weak and they were sinful. Can we please have this person come to us now? That's why Isaiah prophesies this. He says this will happen, it will come. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with, the ear, with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed land. Remember guys, uh, justice, righteousness. Justice, everyone has what they need. Righteousness, all relationships are repaired. Everyone is in unison with one another. This is what we want in our country. This is what they want in their country. This is the only one that will do it. And he will execute justice fairly. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth. And he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. This is the kind of king we want. 
Let's keep on reading. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will, die, will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and a child will leave them. The cow and the bear will graze, the young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hands into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain. For the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. Holy mountain, that's where Exodus 19 happened. <coughs> knowledge, the one thing that they've always had of God, but they didn't adhere to. And now it says the land will be full of this. Let's read the last few verses. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. Yay! God is still concerned for everyone. The nations, yes, plural, will look to Him for guidance, and His resting place will be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend His hand a second time to recover the remnant of His people who survived from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamat, and the coasts and islands of the West. So beautiful. So hopeful. Can you guys see all the connections from the story that we've read up until this point? This is not only for Israel. The picture is bigger. Why? Because right at the beginning, the picture was also big. God's covenant with Abraham was meant to be a big picture for all peoples. Now, just in case you are interested in biology, right, and zoology and entomology, Isaiah is not advocating for a new natural world. That's kind of important, right? So if you read about this party line next to this one, and this one engaging with this one, it's poetry, guys. It's a way that Isaiah creates an imagination with us that in this world where there's all these op parties of opposition, there will be peace, and people will be able to live with one another in a new way. Oh, I can't wait to get to communion. So Isaiah keeps the dream alive. Now, even though Isaiah keeps the dream alive, it doesn't go better with the people. It's kind of a bummer. Right? So I'm at Isaiah 18 now, and I know what lies ahead. I'm going to have to go all the way through to 66 for some hope. And I still have 21 chapters of judgment left to read. It's hardcore, guys. Let's be honest. So it's not better. It doesn't get better. It actually gets worse for these people. And that's why we also have lamentations in the book of Isaiah and in other prophets. Then crying out to God on behalf of the people saying, please now, please, 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 just do what you said you will do. Here's a lamentation for you from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 9 to 16. Therefore, justice is far from us, but we crave so much is not here, and righteousness does not reach us. We just read in Isaiah 11 that when this king comes, this will be close. Did you guys see it? And this king will rule with these two character traits. And now we're reading the people cry out and say, we still don't have justice, we still don't have righteousness. We hope for light, but there is darkness. Who was the one who spoke light into being in the beginning? And why is there darkness all of a sudden? For brightness, but we live in the night. We grope along the wall like the blind. We can't see. We grope like those without eyes. We stumble at noon as though we were in twilight. We are like the dead among those who are healthy. Does this sound like paradise to you? It's definitely not. Do you guys realize how far we've slipped and how horrible things have become for the people? Let's read verse 11. We all growled like bears and moaned like doves. When last did we growl? We growled when we were in Egypt. Right? That's the same word being used there. Is we were really, really groaning and growling because of this oppression that we were. We hope for justice, but there's none. For salvation, but it is far from us. And here's the reason, according to them, for our transgressions have multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgression and deception against the Lord, turning away from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and utterly lying words from the heart. That's all Genesis 3. Do you guys see all the bolts? Sins, transgressions, lying, um, uh, concealing these words in the heart. The heart, that's the problem. Look at verse 14. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far off. Truth has stumbled in the public square. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is missing and whoever turns from evil is plundered. The Lord saw that there was no justice and he was offended. And then this. He saw that there was no man. Not a single one. 
He was amazed that there was no one interceding. So his own arm brought salvation. And his own righteousness supported it. Isn't it unbelievable to see that when the people of God were at their lowest point, when they literally felt like they were in the dark, God was still looking for this one person that would obey him and that would do what he had done, what he has done, what he wants done. So that's right. And then he couldn't find one. So he decided to get involved himself. And that's why this poem says that his own arm brought salvation. God's initial plan was to bless people. God's initial plan was to have people obedient to him. God's initial plan was to forgive people their trespasses and sins. And now he is going to do it himself. He's going to roll up his sleeves. He's going to get involved personally. And how is he going to do it? That's the big question at the end of the Old Testament. Because if you ever read the Bible, you'll know that this is where the Old Testament ends. It ends with this hope. It ends with this firm belief that someone will come. And now the question is, how is Yahweh going to extend his arm? Let's look at our teaching text. So Matthew 1 says, the birth of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's a new name for you. The Savior, the King. That's what it means. Jesus, the one who saves. Christ, the King. So here we go. The birth of the Savior King. Yes, we've been looking for him this whole time. He's the one that was promised. It came about this way. And it came through the Holy Spirit. The one that created life in the beginning of the story. The one that was promised to be on this king is the one that is now conceived and born by this spirit. Check, check. It seems like we're on the right path here. It's happening, guys. Feel the expectation. Second slide, please, Joanne, if you can do that for me. An angel of the Lord, right? So a messenger from the one who we've read about this whole time. Do you guys remember all the bolts? Lord, Lord God, God, Lord, Lord your God, God your Lord, the God of... It's the same one. He sends his messenger, and his messenger speaks to someone who comes from the line of David, which is a promise that was made back in 2 Samuel 7. And here's the promise. A son. Do you guys remember in 2 Samuel 7? It said that there will be a really intimate relationship between this father and this son. And you are to name him what? Jesus. So in his name, he carries the characteristic of the job and function that he will do. And look at it. It's spelled out there. He will save his people, plural again, from their sins. Can't argue with this. This has been the problem since page 3 of the Bible. And it's going to be sorted out now. As was promised by God who keeps his covenant. Who promised that someone will come. And now Matthew doesn't have you guess who this person is. He says this is the Savior King. This is the one that comes from the Lord. This is the one that comes through the Spirit. This is the one that comes from the line of David. And this is the one that will do what? Save people from their sins. And then, as a final argument from the writer, he quotes what? He quotes Isaiah, the prophet who we just read. And he says, see, the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son. And they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. You guys remember the first sermon in the series? I will be with you. That's what Yahweh means. Eh? If we're a share, if we're I am who I am and I will be, I will continue to be who I am and I will continue to be there for you. This is it. The greatest act of salvation. Starting with the birth of Jesus Christ. No. How epic is this story? Let's be honest. Like if we read it as easy, we've got, yeah, it's good. Enough. How awesome is it to know the backstory? How awesome is it to know that this is the definitive act of God to save His people and to bless His people. This Jesus grew up. He was a phenomenal teacher. He did many miracles. He always spoke about the kingdom of God. And eventually this Jesus sacrificed Himself so that you and I can be saved from our sin. So that our sin could be covered. So we could get back to the paradise. So that we could be in an intimate relationship with God. So that we can know Him and that His Spirit can dwell in us. And all of that happened. Through Jesus' name, yes, for the torture of the cross and for his blood to be shed.